Morning. 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 It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, your Bibles might want to automatically open to, to the Gospel of Mark, uh, but, but control your Bible and open them up this morning instead to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at this morning. I'm going to be taking a look in at uh, these verses of 12 through 16 uh, and how we can have a faith that grows this morning. If, if I were to ask uh, all of you who have placed your faith in Jesus, do you want your faith to grow? You would, I, I would hope you'd all say yes. Right? Everyone in this room would say, yes, I want my faith to grow. I want to have a growing faith. And, and that's a good thing. That's a right thing. But the sad reality is that, that, that many Christians aren't willing to take the steps that are necessary to have a growing faith. Right? Because it takes effort. It, it, it takes work to have a, a growing faith. And, and so, so they don't want to do this because it's, it's hard work. It takes intentionality to grow in the faith. You know, we won't grow in our faith simply because we say we want to grow in our faith. No more than we will lose weight because we say we want to lose weight. Right? <laughs> There's things that we must do. Or Rod's looking at me. We want to put on weight. Right? <laughs> right? Some people, not many people have that problem that say they, they would like to gain weight, but most of us, y'all get my point, right? That just because we say we want to do something doesn't make it so. We have to put in the time put in the effort uh, to, to do that. Uh, you know why that, that man that you admire so much in that church who knows so much scripture, you know, you know how he can quote scripture so much? You know why he can do that? Because he's worked at it. That's right. He's worked at it. Right? He, he, he's putting it in the time. He's putting hours and hours of work in scripture memorization. You know how that young lady is, is so confident in sharing her faith. You know how that is? It's not just automatic. Right? She's worked at it. Right? She's worked at it. She's put in the, the, the time. She's put in hours upon hours of practicing and perfecting, sharing her faith. That's how she's comfortable with sharing the gospel because she's practiced. She's worked at it. She's worked hard at it. Do you know how that elderly couple has been able to stand firm in their faith even though their lives have been rocked by one health crisis after another? They've worked at it. They've worked at it. they spent years meditating and hiding God's word in their hearts, they've done what Psalm 34, 8 says over and over again. Psalm 34, 48, 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You see, this couple keeps on testing and seeing that the Lord is good. They keep on trusting and the Lord keeps on blessing them and growing them in their faith. You see, there is no shortcut to growing in your faith. There is no shortcut. If there was one, I would have taken it. Trust me. <laughs> right? I'm always looking for the easy way. Don't laugh because you are, you're the same That's way right. as me. Right? There's no shortcut in growing in your faith. You're going to have to work. And let me just pause and, and, and make sure that I'm being absolutely clear. When I talk about growing in your faith, I'm talking about maturing in the faith. I'm not talking about saving faith. I'm not talking about you have to work to be saved. You don't have to work for saving faith. That's not what I'm talking about here. About the saving faith is the restored relationship that we have with God. That's what the Bible calls justification. I'm not talking about that this morning. What we're talking about this morning is the maturation process of a saved person. Now, sanctification is that churchy work, right? Being sanctified. Growing in our faith is a major part of that. right? He expect, God expects us to become more and like his more and more like his son Christ. Uh, he expects us to grow in our faith. He expects us to mature, right? And it's only natural that, that he would expect that from us. When think about it, when you were a child, your parents expected you to think and behave like a child, right? When you were a child. They expect you to you to grow physically and mentally and intellectually and emotionally, all these things. But then when you you were a teen, that changed. But there were still expectations for you to grow, right? To continue to mature, to, to, to grow intellectually and mentally and all these things. And then when you became a, an adult, things changed. Right? When you became an adult, they began to treat you differently because you had grown. They expect you to think and behave like an adult. Though we know that's not always the case, right? Some of us are stuck. Some of us are still trying to grow up, still trying to mature. But, but even as senior adults, we're, we're still not done growing, right? 
Right? We never stop growing. Now, we don't grow physically anymore. Not vertically anyways. <laughs> uh, I've noticed uh, here lately that that I'm, I'm shorter now than I used to be. You know, and I'm just, I'm just now passing over 50. I'm thinking I might be four foot tall if I live to be 100. I keep shrinking. I was 5'10 when I graduated high school. I'm like 5'8 and a half. I went to the doctor and they married me. I said, that can't be right. I'm 5'10. I said, no, you're 5'8 and a half. And I, and I think you're cheating. I think you're standing up a little taller. But either way, we don't, we don't continue to grow that way. But God has designed us to continue to grow and mature mentally, intellectually, and emotionally until we take our last breath or something happens to us before then that makes it where we can't, right? Something happens medically to us, maybe. As Christians, our Heavenly Father has designed us and given us the capacity to continue to grow and mature spiritually, too. So add that to the list, right? Mentally, emotionally, intellectually, and for Christians, spiritually, He expects us to grow, giving us a capacity to grow. And as Christians, we never completely get done growing in our faith. We never get to that point where we're, just, we're done. Like we, we, we know all we need to know. We understand God's word to perfection. We understand the, the nature and character of God completely. We never, ever reach that point. None of us will. We never reach that, reach that point of being perfectly mature in our faith. See, there's no way that we can read our Bibles and come to the conclusion that God doesn't really care if we grow in our faith or not. Right? We, there's no way that you can read your Bible and come to that conclusion where, where we can say, well, I, I don't think that God really sets a very high priority on whether or not His people are maturing in the faith or growing in their knowledge and understanding of Him. I don't think, there's no way that you can come to that conclusion. If you come to that conclusion, you're not reading your Bible. Right? You're just making a, a faulty assumption about God. And that's never healthy. The question for us is, isn't if God cares if we grow in our faith or not. The question for us is, what does God's Word say about how we can grow in our faith? And so let's find out together this morning as we look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 through 16 together. So let's grab our Bibles, if you have it, one with you, and let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 through 16. Paul begins in verse 12, says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. This is God's Word. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us. We thank you uh, for the, the Word of God. We thank you for your Son, Jesus. And God, we ask that you would teach us your Word this morning. God, we thank you that you have given us the ability and the capacity to grow in our faith, Father. And now we ask that you would motivate us, motivate us to grow in our faith. And as we look to these uh, words that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, God, let us apply these truths to our lives. Help us to grow. Help us to bring honor and glory to you in everything that we say and everything that we do. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First Timothy is part of, of what is known as the pastoral epistles, uh, which also includes Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, these are basically letters written by Paul to two young pastors. Right? They needed some uh, some help. They, they had both uh, trained with with Paul. They had traveled with Paul, and, and Paul had invested in them. In them. And both of them, uh, Paul looked as basically being spiritual sons. Right? That that he invested in, in them deeply and. and and help to equip them as pastors. I think this was uh, written to, to help them to grow in their faith, not just as pastors, but to grow in their own faith, right, to be better pastors. Now, to be clear, there are some things written in these letters that are, are specific to pastors and the calling of pastors. Uh, but however, as we read, as you'll see in this text, anything that pertains to growing in the faith 
can apply to anyone, right? It's not just specific to pastors, right? That many of the things that we're going to look at in our passage this morning, you say, well, he's, this is if you if you can't get past the fact that Paul's writing to Timothy, and and that he's a pastor. And you can't put set that aside and apply these truths to yourself. You're going to have trouble today. If you're thinking, well, I'm not a pastor, so this won't apply to me, you're wrong. Right? These, all of these apply to us. Almost all of these, in some way, shape, or form, we can apply these truths to our lives. And that's what we have before us this morning. Keys to growing in our faith. The first key to having a faith that grows that we see in our text is that we must practice our faith. Let's practice our faith. To grow in our faith, we must put our faith into action, right? Use it or lose it. Well, I mean, you, you hear that before. If there's something that you have, a skill set that you have, and, and, and you don't put it to work, over time, you forget how to do that. I mean, how many times do people, you know, you may have rode a, ridden a bike a lot when you were growing, growing up. You say, it's, it's so easy. It's like riding a bike. You never forget you may not forget how to ride a bike, but if you get on a bike after about 20 years of not riding a bike, it's weird. <laughs> it's awkward, right? And, and, uh, and it, can, it can end badly. Same way with us, with our faith. There's things that we must do to continue to, to practice and put our, our, our faith into action. We practice our faith by being a Christ-like influence to others. We see that in the very first part of verse 12. It says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers. In the Greco-Roman culture of that day, uh, you know, you had to be really old to be considered a man. It's believed that Timothy was probably in his mid-30s, and, and to, in that culture, he was still considered a youth, right? And, and so they, they, the, the people, he would have had trouble with the people uh, in the community. He would have had uh, trouble with some of the people in his church that, were, that were still weren't willing to submit to him or listen to him because they think he was just a boy, even though he's 35 years old, right? He, he's a, 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 a man. But they still see him that way, and they have a hard time for respecting him and, and listening to what he says. But whatever he was lacking in age, he more than made up for in experience, right? He more than made up for in experience. His, you know, he was made wise through his many travels with the Apostle Paul. He, he had uh, earned his way, uh, earned his stripes in the, the, the missionary field, and, and, he, and he had been through the school of hard knocks. Timothy may have been a young man, but he was not immature in his faith. Otherwise, he would have never have been qualified to be a pastor. Right? Paul would have never installed him as a pastor if he wasn't mature. Timothy had learned from the best. Pastor, teacher, evangelist, missionary, church planter there was in the Apostle Paul. You see, he was ready to be a pastor, but he still had lots of room to grow as a pastor. Right? I can identify with this. I I knew that I was called to be a pastor, and I, and I felt that I was somewhat ready to be a pastor. But here, after eight years, I still realize I, I got a lot of room to grow. And some of y'all, don't say amen. <laughs> don't say amen to that. That'd be mean. But you know it's true, right? I know it's true. I, I still have lots of room to grow as a pastor and as a follower of Christ. Timothy was mature in the faith, but he still had lots of room to grow in his faith. So you must be careful to not place limits on people in the church because of their age. That's right. Because of their age. And that works both ways. I mean, Paul's talking about uh, youth and inexperience, but we must be careful to not do the same thing with people who are older. Don't, don't make assumptions. You've heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. Right? That, that applies in the church in the same way. I, I have met young people who are very mature in the faith. I've, been, I've, met, I've met many older people. White-haired people who are very immature in their faith. So don't judge a book by its cover. We shouldn't presume that a young person is immature in the faith. Likewise, we shouldn't presume that a senior adult is mature in the faith either. And so how can we get a sense of someone's maturity level? I think we listen to what they say and we watch what they do. We listen to what they say and we watch what they do, right? They listen listen to... to how much they understand God's word, but, but not only that, uh, uh, watch how much of God's word they actually apply to their lives, right? That's a good sign of someone's maturity or, or lack of maturity. Paul told Timothy to be an example to the believers there in Ephesus. Like Timothy, someone that is more mature in the faith will have a more positive and more Christ-like influence 
on other believers. Amen? The, the more we're like Christ, the, the more positive influence, the more positive impact we'll have on the people around us. Those who, who are immature in the faith tend to have a less positive and less Christ-like influence on other believers. They're typically new to the discipleship process, or maybe they have rejected it altogether. That's a big problem in the church, not just our church, but in many churches, right? We'll, we'll have people that will profess faith, we'll, we'll, we'll get them baptized, we'll welcome them into the fellowship of the church, and then, we're, then, then it's like getting teeth pulled to get them to come to Sunday school, to get them to uh, engage in discipleship. That's what we're called to do, right? Make disciples of all nations. We, we can't disciple people who don't want to be discipled. The call is not to make converts. The call is to make disciples, and, and we, we must get them Try to get them whatever way we can to engage in the discipleship process. That's why they. That's why so many professing believers are stuck where they are. They're not growing in their faith because they're not engaging the discipleship process. They're not coming to Sunday school. They're not coming to discipleship training. They're not taking advantage of discipling relationships. None of those things. And so, therefore, they're stuck. They're stuck there in, in that, that preschool or that kindergarten level of their faith. And the sad thing is some of them are okay with that. They're okay with that. They're not interested in growing at all. None of us want to be that person, or at least we shouldn't want to be that person. We should want to grow in our faith. And one of the ways that we do that is by being a Christ-like influence to others, especially to other believers, right? That's what discipleship is, right? Influencing others for Christ. We practice our faith by being Christ-like in our attitudes and our Actions continuing in verse 12, he says, Be an example in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and purity. For all you type A'ers, then here's your to do list. All right, you ready? You ready for the list? I know some of you like to make lists and like to have a to do list, so here you go. To grow in our faith, we must practice being a Christ like, being Christ like in our words, our words and the speech that we use, right? The speech. We must practice being gracious in how we speak to others. Boy, that's a foreign concept nowadays, isn't it? Being gracious. Everybody's so adversarial and everybody's so confrontational. And everybody seems to be so, so mean to each other, right? And, and, and there's no grace in the speech that we hear today. We must practice ways to build people up with our words instead of tearing them down. Even when the occasion arrives when we need to speak hard truth to others, we must do what Ephesians 4.15 says. It says to speak the truth in love. That's right. right? To speak the truth in love. Secondly, to grow in our faith, we must practice being Christ-like in our conduct. Right? Our behavior, our actions. We must practice being like Jesus and how we live our lives and how we treat others. Right? Be Christ-like in how you treat people. Jesus' conduct could be summed up with one word. Righteous. Everything that Christ did was righteous. He was righteous in his thoughts, righteous in his actions, the way he treated others. Jesus lived a righteous lifestyle, and for us to grow in our faith, we, we must practice living a righteous lifestyle also. Right? Let me just pause for a second and thinking about Jesus, me and Christ. Like what one word would best describe your conduct these days? <laughs> right? Don't answer out loud. I'm just asking you, you know, what one word, right? It, it, it could be any number. Hopefully, it'd be righteous. But if you're like me, it's, it's probably not righteous. It might be anxious, right? Anxious or fearful or, or, or frustrated or, you know, fill in the blank for whatever the word it is. But, but our goal, if we, want to, if we want to have a positive influence on others, then we want to strive to be righteous like Christ is righteous to, towards others. To grow in our faith, we must practice being Christ-like in our love for God and our neighbors. Right? That's the first and, and great command that's given to us in Matthew 22, 30, uh, 37 to 39. Right? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This should go without having to be said. But we must be practicing being Christ-like in love towards one another within the church. Right. Yes and amen that we, right. we should be loving towards those outside the church, but doubly so and especially so to, towards one another within the body of Christ. 
John 13, 30, 35 says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's our love for one another that makes the church attractive to the lost. Right? Believe it or not, that's, that's what people see about us, how we treat each other and how we love one another. That, that's what makes the church attractive. Likewise, our disunity and lack of love for one another that makes the church unattractive to the lost in our community. So we must be careful to demonstrate love towards one another. To grow in our faith, we must practice being Christ-like in our spirit. Some translations leave out this one. Right? If you may have a Bible that doesn't have this, that, that's why. It doesn't, it doesn't have it because it wasn't listed in many of the earliest manuscripts that, that have been found. And so you may have it, you may not. If you do, great if you don't, no biggie. Right? Don't, don't, don't sweat it. But the general understanding is that our spirit, our attitude should match the example that Jesus set for us. Have a Christ-like spirit, Christ-like attitude at all times. And then fifthly, to grow in our faith, we must practice being Christ-like in our faith. This might be the most obvious of all. Amen? This should be the most obvious of all, but have a, be Christ-like in our faith. Nobody exhibited greater faith in God than the Son of God. And to be clear, our faith will never come close to equaling Jesus' faith. That's, right. Right? That's a very high bar, a very high standard that he set. But we are to keep striving to grow in our faith, keep asking God to increase our faith, keep trusting God even when it doesn't make any sense. Right? That's the kind of faith that we're called to have. We truly want to live a life that is pleasing to God. We must live a life of faith because that's what we're told in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Who's the Him? God. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Other believers, especially younger believers, are always watching how the more mature believers in the church respond to difficult circumstances. We talk about this quite a bit. Somebody's always watching you, right? That's right. Somebody's always paying attention to you, watching you. They want to see how you respond. They, they want to see if, if your actions match your words. Mm -hmm. right? they're, they're looking for, for us, whether we're, we're actually uh, uh, hypocritical or not in what we say. right? If we're right. honoring God with our lips, but we're not honoring God with our hearts. They're, they're watching for all these things. The world is watching us. Our unsaved friends, our co-workers and family members, they're all watching. What will they see in us? Will they see fear or will they see faith? Right? Will they see fear or will they see, they see faith? Number six, to grow in our faith, we must practice being Christ-like in our purity. No charge against Jesus was valid because he was perfect. He was sinless. It's worth noting that the religious leaders could only charge him with blasphemy. There was absolutely no way they could convince anyone or to come up with some type of a scheme where they could accuse him of being an adulterer or a fornicator or a drunkard. Right? Why? Because his life was marked by purity. Purity. The people that knew Jesus was that knew he, that he was a man of purity because they could see it in his life. Jesus didn't just talk about purity. Jesus practiced and modeled purity. And we should do the same. Is it hard to live a life of purity in the midst of a culture that celebrates impurity? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. It, it's hard. In, in fact, I would say without the power of Christ's spirit within us, Guess what? It's impossible. That's right. But because we do have God's Spirit within us, it is possible. We must take every opportunity to live lives of purity. It's possible because the blood of Jesus has made it possible for us. The Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to continue to grow in his faith as a pastor. And for Timothy to continue to grow in his faith, he needed to practice his faith. For us to continue to grow in our faith, we must practice our faith too. Amen? Sure. We must practice. Practice our faith. The second key to having a faith that grows that we see in our text is that we must perfect our faith. 
perfect our faith. Timothy had learned the ins and outs of pastoring, preaching, evangelizing, church planning as a disciple of the Apostle Paul. I'm certain that Paul also taught Timothy the value and necessity of personal spiritual disciplines. When I, when I say that, I'm talking about prayer, reading Scripture, studying Scripture, meditating on the Scriptures. And Paul mentions Timothy's need for the spiritual disciplines and need for him to remain committed to his calling again and again in both 1st and 2nd Timothy. If you read through, you can't miss it. It's everywhere. One of the most popular examples of this is in 2 Timothy 2.15. He tells him, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy's saving faith was perfect because saving faith is God's perfect gift to us. All right, that's not an issue there. there. There's nothing that needs to be worked on there. Saving faith is perfect. It needs no improvement. Timothy's sanctifying faith and his gifting as a pastor still had a lot of room to grow. But that's true for all of us, isn't it? That's true for all of us still today, regardless of where we are in the sanctification process. None of us want to be ashamed, do we, when we stand before God? None of us want to be ashamed of our lack of growth when we see God. The spiritual disciplines aren't just vital and necessary for pastors. The spiritual disciplines are vital and necessary for every follower of Christ. All of us. Right? Anything that you might expect of me to do as your pastor, you should be doing it for yourself. Right? We all need to pray. We all need to, to read God's Word. We all need to study God's Word. We all need to meditate on God's Word. We all need to, to, to have accountability built into our lives. We all need to be sharing the gospel. All of us have these same things that we need to be doing to perfect our faith. To perfect our faith by taking in and talking, of, of, uh, talking out God's Word. Verse 13 says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. It seems as though Paul was planning on visiting Timothy soon, and knowing Paul, Timothy would have expected to receive more pastoral training and maybe more insights into the Scripture. But basically Paul was telling this, Paul was telling Timothy this, Don't wait on me to grow in your faith. Right? Don't wait on me to grow in your faith. Don't wait on me to be perfecting your faith, Timothy. Get to work. Feed yourself. Train yourself. Right? You see, that's the goal of discipleship. Yes, there's a place for formal training and, and Sunday school hour and a discipleship hour. And, and, and God, I hope week after week as I preach and you sit under my preaching, you are being equipped with God's Word and being trained that way. But you, as a believer, need to be growing up in your faith and developing a way to train yourself. Right. Train yourself. Feed yourself. If all you're depending on is what you get on Sundays, that's not enough. Amen. No wonder you're so weak. Especially if you're not consistent in your, in your attendance. Right? If the only time you get exposed to God's Word, if the only time you train, if the only time you get fed is when you come here, you're in trouble. That's right. You're in trouble. You're going to be, you're going to be in a bind. Like Timothy, to perfect our faith, we need to give attention to reading God's Word. We can't apply the truth of God's Word if we aren't reading the truth of God's Word. Right? We can't apply what we don't know. We can't tell the difference between a true teaching of Scripture and a false teaching of Scripture if we aren't reading God's Word. We don't know the, the difference between a false teaching or a true teaching if we don't know God's Word. That's why so many people are duped That's right. by counterfeits. Right? False teachings, false gospels, they're everywhere. It's safe to assume that Paul intends for Timothy to study God's Word too as he reads God's Word. But at a very minimum, we need to be reading God's Word and reading it daily. That's right. And we talked about it in men's Sunday school a little bit this morning, maybe before class, we were talking about uh, Mr. Lee was saying he's having problems trying to, to, to remember what he's read lately, and he's starting to read smaller sections so he can remember. And I said, that's a good thing. That's right. It's better to read a, a, a little bit of Scripture and remember what you're reading than to read a bunch and remember none of it. Mm. It's not a race. That's right. It's not a contest who can, who can read the most Bible. Right? But we must be reading. We must be taking in the Word of God. 
We can't hide God's word in our hearts if we're not reading God's word. Now, I know some of you are sitting here this morning and you're saying, well, I, I don't read good. I'm not a good reader. I'm not a consistent reader. And, and I understand that. Before I went to seminary, I wasn't either. But guess what seminary did? Seminary made me read. Right? And so I'm a reader now. And, uh, and it's a blessing to be able to read. I, I love to read. And, and things are helpful to me. And I, I try to be picky about what I do read because I don't have so much time. I don't want to waste my time reading things that don't help me grow, don't benefit me. Right? And I like to share those things that I find with others. But, but for you, if you say, well, I'm not a good reader, or maybe you, you, don't, you just don't have good reading skills, can you listen? Can you listen? Because we can do that too nowadays. We can uh, listen to it on a CD or... Or, or on your phone, or there's lots of, we have no reason to not be taking in God's Word. Not, right. not today we don't. And so whatever you need to do, make sure that you're being exposed to God's Word. At the end of Paul's life, when he knew his days were finally coming to an end, all he asked for was a coat and his books. And it says, especially the parchments. Right? Why, why would he do that? I, I believe he wanted his coat to keep his body warm. But he wanted the word of God to keep his soul warm. That's right. Right? He, he, he still wanted God's word. You see, it makes me wonder how much time and attention do, do we give to reading God's word each day? Right? How much time do you, right? Just, just personalize. How much time do you give to reading God's word each day? If you need some advice or some help or some tips on a good Bible reading plan, see Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, how many, how many reading plans do you use? About four or five? Yeah, four or five. He can point you in the right direction. Right? He, he's, he's got that down pat. See Mr. Lee and he'll hook you up with a good Bible reading plan. Some people will tell me this as well. I, I, Brother Mike, I'm just so busy. I really don't have time. I don't have time to, to, to sit down and read God's Word. I say you, you better make time. Yeah. That's right. You better, you better find some time. If you don't have time to read God's Word every day, you need to rearrange your schedule Amen. and make time to read God's Word every day. Again, reading God's Word is best, but if all you have time to do, if all you're able to do is listen to God's Word and do that, it's better than nothing. That's right. But the best way is to read it. There's something about reading God's Word, slowly and carefully reading God's Word that, that gives you the best benefit. Like Timothy, to perfect our faith, we need to give attention to exhortation. Pastors give attention to exhortation through their preaching, and teachers give attention to exhortation through their teaching. Right now, what I'm doing right now is I'm practicing exhortation. Right, That's what this is. Preaching is a form of exhortation. Earlier, uh, uh, Missy and Stacy, what they were doing were exhortation. They were exhorting us right, to, to be faithful, to, to trust God, to, to give God our concerns, to, to pray to Him. Pastors and teachers grow and are perfected in their faith as they exhort others to submit themselves fully to God and His will for their lives. You might be thinking to yourself, that's, that's fine, but what about those in the church who aren't pastors or teachers? What are they supposed to do? It works the same way. That's right. <laughs> It works the same way for every believer. Whatever God has revealed to you in your time of studying God's Word, right again, going back to reading God's Word, whatever you read, whatever God has showed you through His Word, exhort it, share it, tell others what you have read, encourage them with what you have learned from God's Word, exhort them to apply it to their lives like you do. All of us have experienced spiritual growth through the exhortations of others, whether it was a sermon, a Sunday school lesson, or, or a post that someone shared on social media. Yes, we, you know, everybody wants to demonize social media, but look, it's neutral. It's not evil. That's right. It's what you do with it that right. makes it good or bad. And, and many people use it to bless others. I've been blessed incredibly by articles that are shared, or, or just sharing quotes of scripture, or just something inspirational and motivational that's blessed me during the day. And so, all these ways that we see that, that we can uh, be an exhorter of our faith, they exhort others to be faithful. Like Timothy, to perfect our faith, we need to give attention to doctrine. And you say, well, what is doctrine? That's just another way of saying teaching. That's all it is. As a pastor, Timothy needed to be certain that he was preaching sound doctrine. 
and to be certain that he was indeed rightly dividing the word of truth. Like today, there was no shortage of heretics and false teachers in the early church. Paul didn't want Timothy to become one of them. He wanted to make sure that he's teaching sound doctrine. Like today, some pastors would give in to the pressures of being popular, and their preaching would tickle people's ears instead of convicting their hearts. Paul was warning Timothy to not give in to those pressures, right? As a young man, as a young pastor, those pressures were strong against him. As members of this church, we all have a responsibility to make sure that nothing but sound doctrine is preached from this pulpit and taught in our classrooms, right? We all have a responsibility to make sure that nothing but sound doctrine is being taught and preached in this church. That's right. If something is being preached or taught that is openly and obviously false, somebody better say something. Amen. Somebody better speak up. Ask for clarity. And if it needs to be shut down, shut it down. Right? We can't stand for that, no matter who it is. Amen. Whether it's me, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, or whether, whether it's somebody who's been in this church for 50 years, I don't care who it is. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You need to be silenced. You see, our faith can't grow if it's being built up on false teachings. That's sand. That's sand. That's not a firm foundation. We need the rock of God's Word. We can't perfect our faith unless we are taking in and talking out God's Word. Also, we perfect our faith by using our spiritual gifts. Verse 14 says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. I, I sure hope I don't need to spend too much time talking about this. We've been talking about spiritual gifts for the last month in the discipleship hour. And so I don't need to spend a whole lot of time here, or at least I shouldn't. I shouldn't need to. Every believer is given at least one spiritual gift to use within the body of Christ. At least one, Right? If you say, I don't have a spiritual gift, and I'll say you're lost. And you'll say, well, I'm offended. And I'll say, too bad. The Bible says that. The Bible tells us that, that we're all gifted, that God gives us spiritual gifts. If you're saved, you're given a spiritual gift to use, to equip, to serve, uh, to, 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 to boost the body of Christ and to glorify God. Every believer has a purpose within the body. That means every believer matters. Some of you might say, well, I don't really matter. It doesn't really matter if I'm here or not. Nobody misses me. Baloney. Not only do we miss you, we miss your gifting, what you bring to this body when you're not here. Paul was reminding Timothy to, to not grow lazy like some believers do and neglect the gift that God had given him to use to bless and equip the churches there in Ephesus. Paul was reminding Timothy of his ordination service when his gifting as a pastor was formally recognized by the elder, right, the other pastors, and they laid hands on him confirming God's call on his life as a pastor. We still do that today. That's right. right? If y'all remember back to whenever y'all called me to your pastor, I wasn't, wasn't yet ordained, and so that was the last step. I was licensed, but then at Dutchtown, my home church, my sending church, gathered up all the ordained men, ordained deacons, other ordained pastors, and they all laid hands on me, again, right. identifying me and, and, and confirming my calling as a pastor. Same thing as what Paul was talking about here with Timothy. So, so let me just ask, what, what is your spiritual gift? Again, if you're saved, you have one. You have one, at least one. More importantly, are you neglecting it or putting it to use within the church? We also perfect our faith by fully committing ourselves to discipleship. Right. Verse 15, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. Underline that in your Bible. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Paul was cheering Timothy on and encouraging him to do everything within his power to remain committed to becoming the best follower of Christ and pastor that he possibly could be. Don't settle for mediocrity anywhere, especially in your walk with the Lord. Are we doing that? 
and whatever our calling or spiritual gifting is. Right? Are we doing that? Are we doing that as followers of Christ? Paul told, Paul told Timothy to meditate on these things. What things? To meditate on everything that he had written earlier in verses 12 through 14. Paul told Timothy to give himself entirely to them. Give himself entirely to anything and everything that would help him grow in his faith and as a pastor. He was to give himself entirely to reading. He was to give himself entirely to exhortation. To give himself entirely to, to doctrine. He was to give himself entirely to his calling as a pastor. He was to give himself entirely to being the best disciple and disciple maker that he possibly could be. But isn't that what all of us are called to do? Isn't that what all of us are called to do when we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus? Jesus gave himself entirely to us. Should we give ourselves entirely to him? Amen. That's the calling. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When we truly commit ourselves to being perfected through the discipleship process, we begin, we will begin to grow in our faith. And like Timothy, our progress will be evident to all. You can see spiritual growth, can't you? You, you, you may not be able to see it in yourself, but others can see it in you. And let me just add a note there. If you do see someone growing in their faith, tell them about it. Encourage them about that. Look, I really appreciate the way you've been contributing to Sunday school discussion. I can tell that you've really been studying. I can tell that you've really been uh, diving into the scriptures. You're, you're really beginning to, to grow in your faith. What an encouragement that is, right? We all like to have encouragement, don't we? Like to hear encouragement from others that they, they see. Because sometimes we feel like we're not doing anything. We sometimes we feel like we're not being seen. We're not being heard. Maybe what we're doing is not working. We're not growing. And the reason we feel that way is because nobody notices. Nobody says anything. So let's try to be encouraging to one another that we see growth when it happens. But there's a flip side to this. There's a flip side, a, a negative side here as well. When we don't commit ourselves to being perfected through the discipleship process, our lack of progress is evident to all, too. Right? We can see your progress, and we can see when you're not making progress as well. Because you're still a babe in Christ, and you still need milk. We must perfect our faith if we want to have a faith that grows. Amen? Amen. And lastly... The third and final key to having a faith that grows, that we see in our text, that we must persevere in our faith. Perseverance in the faith, to me, is one of the surest signs of true saving faith. Right? If, you're, if you want to try to determine as best you can whether someone is saved, whether you're saved or not, are you persevering? Are, are you remaining? Are you continuing? Anyone that tells you that they used to be a Christian is a liar. Mm -hmm. They're a liar. You know, I, I, think about, I used to be a Christian. And I tell them, no, you wasn't. No, you, yeah, I was. No, you wasn't. There's no such thing as a former Christian. Right? You, once you're saved, you're always saved. Once, once you're saved, you will persevere. You may stumble, you may struggle, but you will remain. You will not denounce, you will not walk away. If you do, you're just, you're just telling everyone that you never were saved to begin with. Once you have truly repented of your sins and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saved and you will remain saved, period, in the discussion. Why do I say that? Because that's what the Bible teaches. That's part of sound Bible doctrine. We see it in God's Word. You say, but what about the, the people that make professions and they get baptized, but they don't stick around, they, they don't remain in the church? What about the people that don't persevere in the faith? They're lost. They're lost. Stop making excuses for those people. I, I don't care if it's your kids. I don't care if it's your grandkids. You better say something. 
Don't let them continue in this deception thinking they're okay because when they were six, they walked the aisle and they said yes to Jesus. We baptized them and they hadn't been back in church since and they're 40 years old thinking they're saved. That's not persevering. You need to say something. The people that don't persevere in the faith don't lose their salvation. The people that don't persevere in the faith never had salvation to begin with. They were never saved to begin with. This isn't a problem that just developed in the last 10 or 20 years. False professions of faith have always been a problem for the church. It's always been an issue. Jesus himself warned about there always being tares among the wheat. Right? Always. Tares among the wheat. It's hard to tell the difference until the harvest time. The Apostle John dealt with this troubling matter rather clearly in his first letter. 1 John 2.19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. What's he talking about there? Perseverance in the faith. Continuing. Not falling away. Not leaving. Lost people don't grow in their faith because lost people don't have any faith to grow in. Right? Lost people don't grow in their faith because they don't have any faith to grow. Lost people don't persevere in the faith because they don't have any faith to persevere in. Paul wasn't questioning Timothy's salvation or his fitness as a pastor. Paul was reminding Timothy of his need to keep growing and keep persevering in his faith. Paul was reminding him to keep growing and persevering in his gifting as a pastor. I was reminding him that his conduct and commitment to God's word served as a powerful example of God's saving grace in his life. It was a powerful witness to others. They could see it in him. We persevere in our faith by being accountable to ourselves. Verse 16, the first few verses there, first few words says, he says, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. It's always helpful to go to a doctor or the dentist for regular checkups. <laughs> Speaking of that, I got one tomorrow afternoon. Dr. Carroll gets to scrape on the seven teeth I have. Gets to <laughs> always ask for a discount. I said, do I, get a, do I get a discount because I'm missing so many? And she just kind of laughs and says no. <laughs> Full price. It's all the same. But we go get checkups because we want to take care of things before they get out of hand. It's better to, to, to notice something's wrong early on and deal with it then before it becomes something major. It's likewise, spiritual. Spiritually, it's the same way. It's better to catch a problem early on and deal with it before it becomes something major. Like Timothy, we need to take heed to ourselves to make sure that we aren't develop, developing a pattern of conduct that is detrimental to our spiritual health or to others. Right? To, to pause and take inventory. Is there something amiss in my life? Am I... Is there something happening in my life? Am I beginning to drift? Am I beginning to not pray as I should? Am I beginning to not read God's words as I should? Am I, be, am I beginning to develop a pattern of missing church? Something always comes up. No, no matter what it is, something always happens. I can't make prayer meeting. I can't make it to Sunday school. Right? The checkup's going to say something's wrong. Take heed of yourself. Something, something is going wrong with you spiritually. Something is happening with your walk with the Lord. More important, we need to take heed to ourselves to make sure that there isn't anything that we are allowing into our lives that is dishonoring to God, because that happens too. David was a man after God's own heart, and he certainly came to know the importance of taking heed of himself. We have so many of his psalms, right, where he is, he's taking inventory, taking stock of his life and his walk with God. But David even went a step further. And invited God to search his heart. In, in, in Psalm 139, verse 23, a, a popular verse. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. To persevere in the faith requires us to be honest with ourselves about our struggles and our weaknesses. 
There's no room for pride in the life of a believer. That's right. right? There's no room for that. Persevering in the faith takes work. That's what we're told, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2.12. So let me just ask you this. When is the last time you gave yourself a spiritual checkup? When's the last time? I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you from past experience, sometimes, kind of like when we know something's wrong with our physical health. You know, sometimes like a dentist, for example, I, I know that I have an issue. I know that I have this pain in my, in my jaw and I even see inflammation beginning. I, I know, I know, I know it's probably an abscess, but I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to have to go and have to deal with that, so I just, I, I don't want to go for a checkup, and so I just ignore it. Sometimes that's how we are spiritually. That's right. We don't. We just. We just. We know that we're not doing the things that we should. We know that we're not as committed as we once were. We know that we're not reading our Bible like we we once were. We're not praying. We're we're pulling back from the life of the church. We know all these things, but we don't want to. We don't want. We don't want to do a checkup because we know what the answers are, and we don't want to deal with it. That's right. So we just let it linger and let it get worse and worse. When's the last time? You ask God to search your heart for any wicked waves. I think that's the same thing. You know what's in there. You know you have some sin in there and you think it's, it's hidden. It's hidden to me. It's hidden to others but it's not hidden to God. That's right. He knows. He knows. We need to take heed of ourselves and ask God to search our hearts. Lastly, we per persevere in our faith by being accountable to the Word of God. Take heed to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And Paul was doubling down on what he had to just told Timothy earlier in verse 13. He had already told Timothy to pay attention to the doctrine he taught and preached. And now he's telling him to take heed to the doctrine that he taught and preached. Sound doctrine matters because the Word of God matters. Sound doctrine matters because the Word of God matters. Nobody can grow in their faith by believing the wrong things. Right? right. Nobody can grow in their faith by believing the wrong things. Nobody can be saved by believing in the wrong Jesus. How many times have you had discussions with people, even within the church, and they'll, and they'll say, well, my Jesus... My, G, my Jesus wouldn't do that. My Jesus didn't like that. My, my, my Jesus loves everyone, right? And that, he, he would never do something like that. My Jesus. Nobody can be saved by believing the wrong Jesus. Nobody can be saved by believing the wrong gospel. Paul made that abundantly clear in his letter to the church of Galatia. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel. I marvel. Paul was amazed. He was shocked. I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Timothy had been saved by believing in the right Jesus and the right gospel. Salvation was not Timothy's reward because he persevered in the faith. Timothy persevered in the faith because he was saved. Right? You, the salvation is not your prize if you persevere. The reason you persevere is because you're saved. By Timothy's continual faithful preaching and teaching of sound doctrine, others would come to true saving faith. Also, that's what Paul was talking about here. What we believe about God and God's Word matters. That's right. It shapes everything about us. What we believe about God and God's Word matters. It, it, it impacts our life. Every area of our life is impacted by what we believe about God and God's Word. Like Timothy, we must take heed to what we believe about God and God's Word. Like Timothy, we must continue in them, for in doing this we will save ourselves and those who hear the gospel from our lips, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
We must persevere in our faith if we want to have a faith that grows. So in closing this morning, first to my brothers and sisters in Christ, I just want to ask you plainly, are you growing in your faith? Right? Are you? And let me just put it bluntly, it's a yes or no question. How, it's a yes or no. It's not, it's not, well, let me think about it, maybe a little. It's yes, it's yes, I'm growing, or no, I'm not. And please don't, don't do the church thing and, and say yes because that's what you're supposed to say. If you're not, say you're not. Right? Admit that you're not. That's the only way you're going to be able to move forward is admitting that you're struggling, that you're having a problem. If you're not growing or if you've kind of become stagnant in your faith, admit it to yourself this morning because you see, God already knows. That's right. God already knows and guess what? There's people in here that know too. It's evident. That's what Paul said. Your growth will be evident but your lack of growth will be evident too. People right. see. But we're just so nice. We don't want to say nothing. We don't want to hurt your feelings. We want to try to be encouraging to you. So nobody wants to say nothing. So you just keep on doing what you're doing. Pretending like you're growing when you're not growing. And we'll pretend like we don't see it. That's not helpful to anybody, is it? It's not helpful. Admitting that you're not growing in your faith is the first step towards growing in your faith again. Repriming the pump. Right? Start heading in the right direction again. That, that's what the day is. If you're not, if you if you've stumbled, if you've kind of grown stagnant and you haven't grown, you're not growing your faith, today is a great day to start over. To start growing again. Paul told us how. He told us how we can grow in our faith this morning. We can all do this. We must practice our faith, right? Practice it. Keep being Christ-like in our actions and our attitudes. Keep perfecting our faith. Keep giving ourselves entirely to God's word and God's will. Keep persevering in our faith. Keep taking heed of ourselves and our doctrine. Right? That's, that's it. That's, it's not that difficult. All we have to do is apply it. Do what God's word tells us to do. If you're not a Christian yet, you don't have a faith to grow yet. To grow in. But there's good news. You can have a faith to grow in before you leave here this morning. You can, you can start growing in your faith today. You can't have a faith that grows until you have a faith that saves. That's, right. That's where things need to begin for you. The good news is that saving faith is God's gift to the world. It's available to all of us, to all people, everywhere. <coughs> but it must be received as a gift. Because that's what it is. It cannot be earned. It cannot be purchased. It can only be received. And it can only be received by faith. Are you ready and willing to receive God's gift of saving faith for you this morning? If you are, again, going back to what God's Word says, what the Bible tells us, to receive this saving faith, we must turn from our sins. We, the Bible says repent, to turn away from our sins, to turn away from our sins and toward, towards Christ and His righteousness. But it also tells us we must believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Place our, our hope, place our faith, give, give our all, uh, all to Him. Surrender to Him completely as our Lord and Savior. And what He accomplished for us through His death and resurrection on the cross. That's what it means to repent. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. So my question for you this morning, if you're not saved yet, would you be saved today? So church, let's, let's rededicate ourselves this morning. If you're growing in your faith and, and you, you're nailing all these things and you're rocking and rolling and you're just, just keep on keep on doing what you're doing. If you're growing and, and God is blessing, keep doing what you're doing. Don't change a thing. But if you're like most Christians, we could all pick up the pace. Amen. We all need help growing. Let's do what God's Word says. If you're here this morning and you haven't believed in Jesus, place your faith in Jesus today. Be the best decision you ever made, I promise. Let's pray. We'll have a time of response. God, we do thank you so much for this day. God, we thank you for the, the, the clarity of your word. We thank you for uh, being able to, to witness 
Paul's discipleship of Timothy. And the way he encouraged him and the way he spurred him on to, to continue to grow in his faith, to, to grow as a pastor. Father, I pray that you would help us. Your sons, your daughters, your children. God, help us to grow. We know that you want us to grow. and You've told us how we can grow. Father, help us to be everything you want us to be. God, we ask that you be with those who haven't been saved yet who don't have saving faith. God, give them saving faith and they help them to repent, help them to turn from their sins, help them to believe in Jesus, that they might be saved. God, do a work in all of our hearts today. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.